You can start now. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. نتشرف اليوم الجمعية السعودية لصحة الرجل والجمعية السعودية لأمراض النساء والولادة بالتعاون في محاضرة إن شاء الله تكون قيمة جدا بالنسبة للطرفين للأندرولوجيست وللجاينوكولوجيست أول شيء أشكر البروفيسور صالح بن صالح بروفيسور اوف يورولوجي اند اندرولوجي كينج سعودي يونيفرستي من الناس البايونير في في الاندرولوجي اند جاينكو اند اند يورولوجي حيكون هو الكي ليكتشرر في السهره الممتعه ان شاء الله حتكون اشكر جميع الشركات المساهمة سواء كان تبوك ولا دوبامين أشكر الحضور اللي أخذوا من وقتهم لحضور مثل هذه الأمسية حبدأ أن شوية كده ب بعشر سلايدات كده تكلم عن كيف الاندرولوجي والجينيكولوجي اصدقاء وحبايب دائما can i have my share slide please ادون البانل يس شو ماي سكرين Can you see my slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, طبعا أنا كاتب causes of infertility. طبعا causes of infertility is too many. Uh, لكن نحن نحن نتكلم بس عن الميل infertility male factors. بس خلونا كده لو استخدمنا جوجل جوجل سكولر فور كوزز اوف انفيرتيليتي نلاقي كوز اوف انفيرتيليتي حوالي 600000 واحد انترستد ان ان كوزز اوف انفيرتيليتي لو كتبنا ميل فاكتور انفيرتيليتي هنلاقي في تقريبا 500000 يعني اكثر من ال اكثر من النص اكثر من الثلاث ارباع كلهم they are concentrated in male infertility ولا male factor in infertility which is important هذا يدلك انه uh, causes of male infertility uh, uh, is, is important for not only gynecologists but over, uh, overall for all, for all uh, uh, people populations لو ذهبنا إلى male factor infertility in publications وخلو أخذنا PubMed for example نلاقي 333 articles published in the last few years this means that there is enough, not enough publication about male factor in infertility لو لو قلنا what are the causes of infertility اللي نلاقي one third of infertile women have a problem with female reproductive system one third of infertile women has a problem with infertile of male reproductive system and one third maybe they will have both or they are undetermined uh, causes of infertility لو قلنا how common is infertility نحن دائما نقول it's uh, 15% of women they will have uh, uh, infertility ال textbook دائما يقولوا 1 in 10 women they will have a problem 
if they are between the age of 15 and uh, 44. Um, when we talk about uh, uh, what we what we know as a gynecologist, أهم واحد عندنا varicocele. If the patient have varicocele, نقول oh والله خلاص هي this is a male factor. Although there is so many factors in the male that uh, we as gynecologists we don't really concentrate on it, like genetic factors, uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, problem with the tight clothes and hot and sauna, injury to the scrotum, uh, low sperm or low testosterone, uh, misuse of uh, anabolic, and this is unfortunately becoming very common, especially with the, the gym and people they talk together about in the gym about what is the best thing to do. Uh, uh, premature ejaculation, especially in diabetic patient, testicular cancer and treatment, and undescended testicle. So all these uh, factors are very important, but we as a gynecologist, أهم حاجة عندك low sperm. رحت لدكتور الاندروجي وقال لك إنه عندك دوالي خلاص هذه الدوالي يعني إنه عندنا إننا نحنا عرفنا نص ليش. التشخيص. Although there is so many things more important than the Wali. <coughs> when we come to the diagnosis, all what we do, semen analysis. And we usually do semen analysis only. We don't do biopsy, we don't do tes uh, testosterone, we don't do thyroid, we don't genetic, we don't do uh, any scrotal ultrasound. Because we we concentrate only on the sperm analysis to make the diagnosis that this is a male factor and always we refer it to the andrologist and the andrologist will, they will do the rest of the job. <coughs> if we go to the evidence, uh, A, consistent with good quality patient orientation, inconsistent with limited quality patient, consistent with the disease orientation, and yes, so this is a presentation, a preparation for confirmation of ovulation should be obtained with the serum progesterone level at day 21. This is good evidence. Hysterosalpingogram is an important factor. Uh, and this is why we do hysterosalpingogram most, most all, all of the patients. Uh, in unexplaining fertility, Please do not offer induction of ovulation, offer intrauterine intra insemination, because they are already ovulating. There is, must be another reason. Women with body with body value index uh, greater than 30 is uh, evidence B. In this practice in gynecology, do not perform immunological testing. Do not perform immunological testing as part of the routine. Uh, infertility ovulation uh, evaluation. This is by the American Society of Reproductive uh, Medicine. Do not do routine order uh, thrombophilia testing patient undergoing uh, infertility evaluation. But please do semen analysis. Semen analysis is important. When we do semen analysis, uh, most of the of the lab, they refer to the WHO organization 2010. Maybe there is an update now. The reference guide now says that uh, morphology has to be more than 4%, motility more than 30%, uh, sperm count more than 39%, very jack, uh, 15 millions. And uh, fatality, it must be 58%, and volume at least 1.5%. This is just a uh, brief uh, for our presentation today. Our presentation today is uh, uh, mainly concentrate on, uh, uh, on something called antioxidant. The antioxidants uh, 
has been in the market for a long time now. Unfortunately, a uh, thousand, well, actually a thousand, to be, to be more honest, uh, hundreds of uh, companies, they have antioxidants, different antioxidants. Are they useful or not? Are they good or not? Uh, uh, Professor Saleh is going to talk about it uh, uh, in sub-fertility treatment and why and what and whether it's good or bad. Please, uh, Professor. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, I can see your slide very clearly. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Hassan. Uh, and it is uh, an honor uh, for me to participate uh, um, yeah, with a lecture, a webinar, or in the gynecology club meeting. And uh, as I said before, hopefully this this can be the the uh, cornerstone for collaboration between our two societies. Saudi Society of Men's Health have been established in 2018, and in its its main mission is men's health, including reproductive and sexual health. So I believe collaboration uh, between men's health, women's health, uh, slash urology, andrology, gynecology can result in uh, a healthy uh, reproduction, healthy uh, individuals, and a healthy community. And at the same time, I would like to extend my uh, sincere thanks to Tabuk Pharmaceutical and uh, Dopamine for organizing this meeting. I'll try to be quick and go uh, directly to the subject of today's meetings. I've been uh, tasked to talk about antioxidants in male infertility, subfertility, which is something concerning both um, andrologists, urologists, and also reproductive gynecologists. As you probably know and aware, these medications are in the market for a long period of time and generates millions and millions of dollars. But we don't know how effective are they, and we don't know what are the best or ideal antioxidant treatment that we can give to our patient to serve them better. At the same time, are we supposed to prescribe it for all comers or for a certain type of people? And who is supposed to prescribe them? I.e., if you if you see an infertile couple, you'll just give the, the male and female antioxidants, or you just do your part and refer the, uh, the, the other party to the concerned specialty, like male to the male uh, urologist. Um, as uh, Prof. Uh, Hassan said, infertility is, uh, is a big subject and represents one of the most common diseases affecting between 15 to 25 of reproductive age couples. We can say with certainty, 50% of the infertility factors uh, have a male uh, root. Uh, the male factor can, can contribute um, uh, solely to 25% and contribute to another 25% in conjunction with the female factors. Now, generally speaking, when we encounter a male factor in fertility, these are the armamentarium for our treatment. So, we can start by medical therapy if there is a medication that can be offered to the patients. And there are also surgical therapies. And we have also the assisted reproductive techniques. That, that's the uh, the main job of our reproductive uh, gynecologist. And over the last few years, a lot of advancement and renovations have been, uh, sorry, innovations have been introduced, whether at the medication level or the surgical therapy, mainly when it comes to sperm retrieval or reconstruction in case of obstructive azospermia. So how can we classify the medical treatment when it comes to male factor infertility? We can classify them either according to the evidence of dependency. So we have a specific medical therapy, i.e. if you have hypogonadism, you can give a specific hormonal treatment to treat that, uh, that disease. Or we have the non-specific empirical medical therapy. We can also further classify them into uh, according to the drug class. We have the hormonal medications and we have the non-hormonal medication. And the antioxidant therapy falls in the non-specific empirical medical non-hormonal 
therapy. As Prof. Hassan said, there are a lot of causes for male factor infertility. When we identify a specific disease, really we get happy because we can help our couples. But unfortunately, when the patient falls in the group of idiopathic infertility, then we have this problem and we have the suboptimal results that comes with the treatment. And unfortunately, the, uh, the, the idiopathic category uh, uh, can uh, or contribute to a substantial number of our patients, more than a third of them are without identifiable uh, treatable causes. Now, for those with idiopathic male cell fertility, we know nowadays that a lot of things that used to be idiopathic now, it's, it's more uh, uh, disease specific. Now, we know some of those idiopathic male factor infertility, they have a problem with their DNAs, and we have also a good number of them, they have pathological causes related to the free radical induced damage to the sperm. And I will just draw your attention to the molecular structure to the sperm. If you just remember from the medical school, the structure of the human sperm uh, composed of plasma cell membrane, which is a very unique structure, uh, um, composed of high levels of polyunsaturated fatty acids. This polyunsaturated fatty acids improve the uh, plasma cell membrane uh, flexibility, uh, but at the same time, it makes them vulnerable to be attacked by the reactive oxygen species. And for those who are not familiar with the reactive oxygen species, they are defined as oxygen molecule containing one or more unpaired electron on an open shell configuration. So you can see in the, in the bottom corner uh, diagram here, if you just remove one electron from the, sh the outer shell, you will end up by uh, an oxygen-free radical. So based on this, the human sperms are extremely sensitive to reactive oxygen species because of their high content of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So I said polyunsaturated fatty acids are important structural component of human sperms. They are important for membrane flexibility and movement and functionality of the sperm. But at the same time, the, these are the, the uh, uh, rate limiting step when it comes to uh, sperm dysfunction. So it can be easily attacked by the oxygen um, free radicals and in turn uh, destroy them. So, and also there are a lot of disease categories nowadays. We know those, the oxidative stress uh, are implicated as, uh, as a cause. Uh, this can include a natural age process uh, as well as a variety of uh, diseases like the hematological or cell tumors uh, obesity or meta other metabolic diseases, uh, Alzheimer, Parkinson, or other neurological diseases. And nowadays, we know more and more that these oxygen free radicals play an important role in the pathogenesis of male factor infertility. There are a lot of uh, classes when it comes to uh, radical oxygen species, and, and you can see in the slide here, these are the most common uh, oxygen free radicals. Some of them are familiar to you guys, and some of them are being used when it comes to wound cleaning uh, or uh, deployment like um, uh, um, superoxide anions or uh, hydrogen peroxides. Now, we need these oxygen free radicals. They are not bad altogether. We need a limited production of reactive oxygen species for the normal sperm physiology. They are important for sperm hyperactivation. They are also important for uh, sperm capacitation uh, or a chromosomal reaction. So overall, in, in a limited number of production, they are important for natural fertilization. But we know infertile men, they have a higher level of reactive oxygen species compared to infertile men. And hence the term oxidative stress comes when we have more production compared to uh, degradation. So uh, the, the, the semen, uh, uh, in, uh, in oxidative, uh, 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 in oxidative stress uh, uh, patients uh, is believed to be one of the main factors in the pathogenesis of sperm dysfunction and sperm DNA damage in the infertile men. So when the rate of scavenging uh, uh, becomes, less than, uh, becomes uh, less than the rate of production 
we end up by uh, oxidative stress and uh, the, the role of antioxidant uh, become uh, clearer. Um, now we have already uh, natural antioxidants in, in the human sperms. We have vitamin E, vitamin C, L-carnitine, superoxide, dismutase, glutathione. They are all natural uh, antioxidants that uh, naturalize the free radical activity and protect sperm from the reactive oxygen species. And we know from the evidence, once those supplements are becoming less in the human uh, semen, then the sperm dysfunction become uh, evident. That can be in the form either decreased concentration or decreased motility, progressive motility, or increased abnormal morphology or abnormal DNA fragmentation. And have been estimated that 25% of infertile men have a high level of semen oxidative stress. This can be attributed to a lot of uh, environmental and non-environmental factors. Uh, we know lifestyle uh, can be a reason for uh, excess oxidative stress. We know also uh, chronic diseases like chronic um, testicular infections uh, can be a reason. Um, uh, reproductive infection, reproductive tract infection, UTI, cystitis, prostatitis, uh, physiculitis, all of them that also induce oxidative stress and autoimmune factors can play a role here. Um, also, uh, the increased level of reactive oxygen species can be resulted from, as I said, a lot of environmental factors such as uh, high temperature, uh, electromagnetic waves in the cell phones, air pollution, uh, insecticides, uh, alcohol consumption, uh, obesity, uh, poor nutrition, all of them play an important role in, in excess production of reactive oxygen species. Don't forget, uh, leukocytes uh, also are a predominant source for endogenous reactive oxygen species uh, during sperm maturation. And this is unfortunately have, have been overlooked by a lot of our colleagues uh, either uh, andrologist or uh, urologist or even gynecologist when they come to treat uh, uh, or process uh, semen. Uh, whenever you have a leukocyte in, this, in the sperms, these have to be treated first before you start any medical therapy or even before you start IVF. Uh, excess leukocytes in the human semen can induce a lot of oxidative stress and hence result uh, will, be, uh, uh, will not be optimal as you wish. Leukocyte production is uh, also enhanced in obesity and leukocytospermia is associated with ele elevated, uh, you can find it by elevated WBC count in the, in the semen when you read it at the bottom. So whenever you have a WBC count more than uh, 1 million, this has to be treated before you start any, any other procedure with a medical or surgical treatment. Do we have any evidence that uh, from the um, from the nutritional related factors that can associate it with male factor of fertility. The evidence is not that strong, but we have some evidence that the TGF-Fister type of uh, nutrition can increase male factor of infertility by, uh, by disturbing either um, the sperm barometers or uh, inducing hormonal level changes or even inducing excess production of reactive oxygen species. You can see from the slides here that the, the circles with the grain, with the, with the with the green uh, color, they have a positive association, and the circles with the um, uh, uh, orange color, they have uh, a negative association with sperm quality. So we know so far oxidative stress imbalance can lead to a lot of uh, cascades, uh, uh, negative cascades when it comes to uh, 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 sperm health. It can cause sperm cell membrane lipid peroxidization, uh, and this is uh, the chemical reaction that uh, damages sperm plasma membrane lipids. It can decrease membrane uh, fluidity. It can reduce sperm motility. It can increase sperm DNA damage. And I have to emphasize this again and again. Oxidative stress can also disturb or induce a DNA fragmentation. Um, oxidative stress can also decrease sperm oocyte fusion capability and also impair fertilization capacity.
Nowadays, also when it comes to medical treatment for oxidative stress, we know uh, we, we, we recently have a, a, a new essay called uh, Total Oxy Radical Scaffolding Capacity that compare the uh, how strong is that medication compared with the other medication when it comes to fighting uh, anti uh, oxi uh, oxidative stress uh, or being uh, being labeled as an oxidative stress uh, uh, therapy. Now. The question that uh, frequently asked, how would we identify the oxidative stress? The answer is not as simple as what we, we can expect uh, because the cost and complexity of the testing prohibit commercial kits that can be uh, used for a daily practice. So it's not easy to, to do them on a routine basis, but there are certain uh, laboratory can uh, provide you with the result if it can change your treatment. But it is costly and very lengthy and complex. We have a direct method and we have indirect method to uh, detect uh, or identify the oxidative stress. The direct method uh, measures the reactive oxygen species, which is the most preferred method. Uh, but the problem with this, many reactive oxygen species are extremely unstable and difficult to measure directly. So not a lot of labs have this direct method, method assay. Most of the uh, labs that can provide you with uh, a number for oxidative stress, they utilize something called indirect method by, uh, by measuring the uh, damage on proteins or the DNA or the RNA or the lipids or other bi biomedicals induced by the uh, reactive oxygen uh, species. Don't forget routine semen analysis can give you also a clue if, uh, if there is ex excess oxidative stress, especially when it comes to motility. Motility or progressive uh, motility is the most vulnerable part of the semen analysis uh, that can be affected with uh, oxidative stress. Hyperviscosity in the uh, seminal plasma is another uh, another parameter that you should look for. Also, a similar leukocyte count is another factor that we should look at our interpretation when it comes to uh, uh, assessing the production of oxidative stress. Now, I will not spend too much time on, the, on this one because it's more uh, more, la more of uh, academic uh, slide. So I'll just go directly to how can we treat our patients with excess oxidative stress? Now, generally speaking, the treatment should be directed first of all to reduce or eliminate the stress provoking conditions like smoking, ask your patient to start smoking. If there is a varicocele, treat varicocele. If there is infection, go ahead and treat infections. If the patient is uh, is uh, exposed to gonadotoxins or hyperthermia. This should be treated to start with. Then antioxidant supplementation comes after or in conjunction with lifestyle modification. And the rationale to use the antioxidant supplementation uh, is based on the promise that seminal oxidative stress is due in part to a deficiency in the seminal oxidations. So if we increase if we can increase the number of uh, uh, the level of the antioxidant therapy in, in the in the seminal plasma, then we can boost uh, the sperm activity. Okay. Now, what are the various ways for treatment when it comes to uh, oxidative stress and antioxidant therapy? Uh, now, just for our colleagues in gynecology or those specialists in IVF XC procedures, now seminal plasma plays a crucial protective role against reactive oxygen species. And unfortunately, this seminal plasma is being eliminated when it's come to semen preparation before XC. And that's why we lose a strong defense mechanism uh, against uh, invaders by oxidative stress before we inject the sperm inside the, uh, the, uh, the eggs. Uh, so its removal during sperm preparation may be hazardous to sperm DNA integrity. 
And the use of spermatozoa for ICSI will carry the same hazard by excluding the protective rule of seminal uh, plasma. And this is the rationale why some, some labs, they went ahead and the, uh, the and part of their protocol for plasma for the semen preparation before ICSI IVF cycle or IUI even is to supplement uh, the media used by uh, um, uh, antioxidant therapy. This does not have been strongly found to be um, concrete, but some people are using it. Also, it is advisable to do a shorter centrifugation time. If you decrease the centrifugation time, you can also save some protective rule for the seminal plasma uh, containing antioxidant therapy. And last but not the least, is to supplement your patient by oral, by oral antioxidant therapy before the procedure that you are attempting to do, whether assisted reproductive technique or even for natural pregnancy. And we'll come later on during this talk for the how, what, what is the evidence beyond this. So what is the ideal antioxidant of choice in male infertility? There are a lot of micronutrients that you can just go ahead and look and Google it or look into the uh, PubMed. You'll find a lot of evidence about a lot of micronutrients. But the most important micronutrients that showed promise when it comes to uh, compacting um, sperm dysfunction induced by reactive oxygen species are the carnitine, vitamin C, vitamin E, arginine, zinc, glutathione, selenium, coenzyme Q10, and vitamin B12. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'll just concentrate on the most important micronutrient from those during my next talk. Um, don't forget essential fatty acids is the energy source for sperm, so it is nice to have it in your antioxidant therapy. Carnitine plays an important role as the energy poster when it comes to sperm motility. Arginine, important for motility and concentration. Zinc, an important trace element for testosterone production, sperm concentration and motility. CoQ10 is involved in energy production and an important and strong antioxidant uh, factor of vitamin B12, uh, when it becomes deficient, um, there is evidence that there is a decreased sperm count and mortality for people with, uh, with deficient vitamin B12. Glutathione, selenium, vitamin E, and vitamin C is, are all important when it comes to uh, uh, um, um, healthy sperm function. This table just illustrates for you what is the recommended therapeutic uh, dose for each one of the antioxidant therapy. And as you can see, if you just go just for one second and concentrate on the L-carnitine, as I said, it's very important stress element for motility and concentration. What's available in the, uh, in the commercial productions is a very low quantity of carnitine. And also, when we prescribe it to our patient, we prescribe it in a very low quantity, actually. We give one tablet or two tablets. Each one of them contains 500 uh, or less of, uh, of carnitine. And the recommended therapeutic dose is between 2 and 3 grams daily. And you have to be aware you should not increase it more than 3 grams because there is also a drawback for excess uh, uh, micronutrient uh, when it comes to side effects. Um, I'll just give you briefly uh, some um, highlights about the most important two uh, micronutrients that uh, I consider should be in every antioxidant therapy given to male patients. L-carnitine is a naturally occurring compound uh, facilitate the transportation of fatty acid into the mitochondria for a beta oxidation. So it's an important um, element when it comes to energy source uh, for sperm motility. The L-carnitine, which is the L-isomer, is the most bioactive uh, form. Uh, so we have to be very careful when you, uh, when you use a specific type of antioxidants containing carnitine is to use the L-isomer, not something else. The D-carnitine is not active. The L-carnitine L-titrate is not for uh, male factor and fertility. And propionyl L-carnitine is also is for cardiovascular reasons. It's not effective for male factors. So the most important one is the L-carnitine or acetyl L-carnitine. 
So for most people, acetyl L-carnitine and L-carnitine seems to be the most effective for general use when it comes to male factor infertility. I'll just skip this. And I'm not going to go through individual studies, but trust me, there are a lot of clinical studies on uh, male uh, fertility uh, showing promising uh, results when uh, L-carnitine is being supplemented in, 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 uh, in appropriate doses when it comes to improvement in the smell quality, concentration, motility, and vitality. I'll just skip that because the, just for the sake of time, you have a lot of studies uh, concluding that the L-carnitine is an important stress element when it comes to antioxidant therapy for male factor infertility. I'll just conclude by this statement from the American Society of Andrology and the European Academy of Andrology. They indicated that the L-carnitine improves sperm parameters and in particular of the total motility and progressive motility. Uh, they also reduce the level of reactive oxygen uh, species uh, in the seminal fluid and improve the quality uh, of the semen. The other important uh, trace element or micronutrient is the CoQ10. Uh, this is a naturally occurring lipid soluble compound found in every cell in the body. It's the uh, energizer of the cell. So it is a potent energy producing micronutrient. Uh, uh, so it's important. It is responsible for energy, uh, for the movement, and, and all other energy-dependent process uh, when it comes to uh, sperm function. Uh, there are also a lot of studies, clinical studies, on human sperms and human body that indicate improvement uh, in the sperm quality when it's come, especially for the most important energy-dependent process like capacitation and also uh, sperm penetration and uh, motility and progressive uh, motility after supplementation by QQ10. Uh, the most important aspect of zinc, as you know, it is the second most uh, abundant metal in our body after iron. And it has been estimated by the WHO that uh, zinc deficiency can affect one third of the world population. When it comes to andrology, male factor, it's an important uh, uh, element for testosterone production and hence the sperm concentration and count. Um, and it has been uh, found that zinc levels are generally lower in infertile male compared to people without infertility. Also, there are a lot of clinical studies indicating importance of the stress element when it comes to sperm function. Leucopene in tomato is very important also as uh, as a, a micronutrient and a potent antioxidant, it's important to have it in, in your antioxidant therapy. And unfortunately, not a lot of antioxidant therapy contain that uh, uh, product. There are also a lot of studies that also prove in the efficacy of lycopene supplementation when it comes to uh, healthy sperm production. Now, the most important subject, which is also being commonly asked by a lot of uh, uh, colleagues is what is the role of combined antioxidants? Most of the commercially uh, 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 available and affordable uh, medications or nutrition, uh, nutritional supplements are combined antioxidants. So is it beneficial to use them or we just go for individual micronutrient and give it to them? The answer is not as simple as this. You need more than one micronutrient. As I told you before, there are four essential micronutrients. To give them on a, an individual doses, it might not be palatable for your patients. And also the compliance might go down. And hence the idea, can we combine them in one sachet or we can combine them in one tablet for easier use and optimal therapeutic um, uh, effect. And hence, you have a lot of companies bringing a lot of antioxidant to the market. You can see here in the, uh, compare the y-axis with the x-axis and concentrate more on the y-axis, the, the vertical columns. You see the different concentration for the different commonly available antioxidant therapy in, in the Saudi market. I'm not 
uh, promoting any particular individual or individual products, but you can take this picture and you can compare it and you find out by yourself how strong is the concentration of each micronutrient in each supplementation available in the market. Uh, the list is very long. I have only here three slides for the most commonly uh, used uh, medications, but you can go yourself and uh, and fetch it. And before you prescribe any anti uh, any combined antioxidant therapy, please make sure what is the concentration of that medication before you prescribe it for your patient, because sometimes it can be just acting as a placebo, a placebo, a placebo effect, because you are not providing your patient with the essential or the recommended daily dose for each individual micronutrient. So is there an evidence for antioxidant therapy use or combined antioxidant therapy? There are a lot of individual studies that have to looked at individual medication or combined medication together. Unfortunately, they are heterogeneous, heterogeneous criteria for inclusion, exclusion, they are looking at different goals. Some of them are just looking at the semen parameters improvement, and some of them are looking at pregnancy as the end results. So that's why we cannot make a, a strong conclusion by looking at individual studies. And from this, it comes to the importance for meta-analysis. Cochrane have already done a good job and have, they have already reviewed the antioxidant therapy for infertility. There are a lot of rev revisions to their meta-analysis. The first one was released in 2014 and the last one was released in 2019. This is the most updated review that included 61 RCTs comparing single and combined antioxidants with placebo. They included in this meta-analysis 18 antioxidant therapy versus no treatment or another antioxidant in the population of more than 6,000 subfertile men. And they concluded from the Cochrane analysis, this slide, which I think this is the most important part of my talk. From the Cochrane analysis review, men taking oral, oral antioxidant therapy had an associated increase in the life birth rate in the IVF patients when compared with men taking the control treatment. So at least we know there is a good beneficial effect when it comes to fertility treated by ARTs. When it comes to natural conception, the role of antioxidant therapy needs further investigation. And as I said before, this is because the evidence that we can get from individual study is not strong. We have a positive association, but that association is not strong to draw a conclusion. So we concluded the author's conclusion from this Cochrane analysis uh, and after reviewing the quality of the evidence, they concluded that the antioxidant supplementation taken by subfertile sub male of a couple attending a fertility clinic might increase the chances for life birth, which is a good statement to start with. However, the overall quality of the evidence was low from only seven small randomized control studies. Is there a rule for antioxidant treatment on sperm parameters and pregnancy rate in infertile patient? after we treat them by varicoselectomy, and this is an important question for our colleagues in andrology or urology. The answer or the short answer is yes. Supplementing your patient after varicoselectomy by anti appropriate antioxidant therapy for at least six months showed a positive uh, effect, and this has been proven already by randomized control studies. Uh, also, this has been also proven by a meta-analysis looking at the effect of antioxidant therapy after varicoselectomy, whether you give or not to give. Uh, the result is positive and assuring and encourage my colleagues to use antioxidant therapy after varicoselectomy. As I said before, why we have controversial results, why we don't have a strong concrete evidence from antioxidant therapy when it comes to semen improvement or if in pregnancy rates. The answer is simple. Now, if you look into individual studies, the patient selections and for the for the involved patient or the control patients are different. Not all of them are RTTs to start with. The associated pathology when it comes to male factor infertility is not homogeneous. Some people they have infection on poor, some people they have varicocele on poor, some people they have chronic diseases on poor. 
um, uh, some studies they use single and some studies use combination antioxidants. Also, the dose and formulation for the antioxidant is different between different uh, studies. The duration of treatment also is varied. Some of them they use uh, the six months cut off uh, before they analyze. Some of them they go as long as one year, but some of them they use only three to four months before they analyze their results. At the same time, we don't have, as I said at the beginning of my talk, we don't have a standardized diagnostic marker for oxidative stress. And also the presence of other molecular or genetic differences between one individual when it comes to response. Some individuals, they, they, they respond favorably and other individuals, they have a very slow, and you need to give them the medication for a long period of time before you start seeing an effect. So, to some lump, the advantage and disadvantage of antioxidant therapy, this is the most also important slides here. I would say the, the at least the most um, available evidence uh, when it comes to um, antioxidant therapy, we know it can also Im it can improve fertilization rate per cycle. Uh, the pregnancy rate, there is, uh, there is uh, evidence, although it comes from a very few studies that it can be improving. And we know also antioxidant therapy can improve sperm DNA fragmentation. When it comes to disadvantages, unfortunately, we lack placebo control double blind design in the majority of the studies available when it comes to obtaining evidence from them. Don't forget also antioxidant therapy is not a, a, a supplement or a, a way of treatment without side effects. And this is the common saying from some uh, physicians, take this medication, if it doesn't help you, it will not harm you, which is not totally correct because antioxidant therapy in excess dose can harm your patient. And there is evidence there is a dose dependent action. Um, at some concentration, a pro excellent effect is present, resulting from a prompt for the sperm uh, motility and viability when you exceed the, more, the, the therapeutic level. If you go, for example, ill carnitine more than three grams, you have a, ne a negative effect on uh, lipo, uh, liposedation, and hence motility and progressive motility of, your, of, the, of the sperm. Certain also micronutrients can induce uh, kidney uh, stones like vitamin E, if, sorry, vitamin C, if you give it in a high doses. Some medications also can, can be a teratogenic, like vitamin E, vitamin A at a higher doses. So from my perspective, if you have to ask me what I think the ideal um, micronutrient for male infertility, this is what I believe from my experience, my uh, follow-up of, uh, of patients, I think a combination of L-carnitine, CoQ10, lycopene, and zinc can be the, at the least, at least, the least helpful when it comes to antioxidant therapy. You can increase or add whatever you want, but those four elements should be present in any combined antioxidant therapy when it comes to fighting reactive oxygen species. So, in summary, oxidative stress plays an important role in the pathophysiology of male infertility. There are already published studies on dietary antioxidants, including RCTs, generally demonstrate a beneficial effect on sperm function. But the optimal type and dose for the medication or for the supplement is unknown yet. Effect in protecting normal sperms from endogenous reactive oxygen species is not established yet. And the majority of antioxidant studies suffer from lack of placebo controlled double blind design, which makes it difficult to reach a definitive conclusion. And the best evidence we have from the Cochrane uh, review database. Keep in mind, early diagnosis of your patient is necessary to avoid progressive oxidative stress-induced damage that might uh, reach to an irreversible uh, state. So this I will come uh, to an end. I'll be happy to receive any questions. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there is anybody who can ask question after this uh, comprehensive, uh, very nice presentation. Actually, it has a lot of uh, 
كلينيكال اند نون كلينيكال ايفن بيزك نوليدج ذات مي بي انف فور ايفري بودي تو اندرستاند وات از انتي اوكسيدنت بت Definitely, we cannot leave you alone without asking you a question. There's somebody here uh, asking uh, uh, impact on uh, prolonged semen uh, liquefaction time on male infertility and its treatment. Prolonged semen liquefaction time. Does it have an uh, uh, impact on fertility? Yes. Did, did you see my picture or the slides already? Do you, do you still yes. see my slides or not anymore? Yes, we are seeing your slide post. We can see your slide is there. Okay, can you stop sharing my slides? Islam, can you stop sharing my slides? Stop. Okay. So, so it's, a, it's it's okay. So uh, it's an important question. I would like to thank uh, the uh, the uh, the colleague who asked this because indeed prolonged liquefaction time indicate ongoing problems. So this is one of the parameters that you look in you in the in the semen when it comes to do you think is there an excess oxidative stress or not. So the answer is yes. Prolonged liquefaction time can lead to decreased motility and progressive motility, total motility and progressive motility, and hence the sperm function. Now the question why there is a prolongation of the liquefaction time. As you know, liquefaction of, uh, of uh, semen is uh, the, uh, the function of the uh, prostate-specific prostate antigen. So when there is a dysfunction in the prostate, whether infection, inflammation, you name it, this can lead to prolongation of liquefaction time, and this has to be treated. The treatment is not to give mucolytic, which is commonly done by our colleagues. This is not the answer. You just you are just you are just giving a paracetamol for fever. You should identify why the liquefaction time is higher, and we have to treat that, whether it is an infection or inflammation. It's not only just giving a mucolytic, and that will not help your patient in the long run. Okay, another question here, uh, Sertoli cell only syndrome. Okay. Uh, how can we treat this uh, problem? So this is not related to, uh, to this talk, but the, the general answer, Sertoli cell only syndrome is one of the terminal stages for non-obstructive azosperm. So that patient who have a Sertoli cell only, he lacks germ cells. Germ cells are the cells that produce spurs. Having said that, 25% of patients with Sertoli cell only evident histopathology by histopathology, they still have a small foci of germ cells and sperm production when you look and, uh, and fit for them. So there is no medical treatment for sperm cell only, but there is a surgical treatment, which is the microscopic testicular sperm extraction. Once you correct any correctable disease, like if the patient is having abnormal hormones, you treat the hormones, if the patient is having varicocele, you treat the varicocele. After that, you go and do microscopic testicular sperm extraction. 25 to 35% of those patients with Sertoli cell only, you might be lucky to find sperms and use them for um, exit cycles. Interesting question. <coughs> Antioxidant agent can be used to prevent aging? That's true. Actually, we know now and uh, oxidative stress can play an important role in the natural aging process. As I said, also it has been implicated in the pathogenesis of cancer and uh, neurological dysfunctions and also infertility. So there are a lot of antioxidant therapy now, although the evidence is not that strong, I have to say that, they have been prescribed starting from the age of 40 for people to delay the aging process. But don't ask me, I'm not the specialist or the appropriate person to answer that question, but I can tell you there are already uh, uh, promotions, promoting, some people are promoting products for this. 
This is very good. I'm expecting now uh, Tabuk Farm to send me some antioxidant, please. <laughs> what uh, What about vitamin D? You did not uh, elaborate on vitamin D, and does it have a role as an antioxidant in sub uh, in male infertility or sub fertility? The evidence for vitamin D vitamin compared, D. To, compared to vitamin C or vitamin E is very low, actually. It is not considered to be an important micronutrient for as an antioxidant therapy. It has a lot of biological rules, but not not an important one when it comes to male factor infertility. Actually, this question came from uh, Professor Hassan Farsi, who is uh, uh, a very eminent uh, urologist, uh, and I'm sure you know him. Uh, and he's asking. Uh, uh, the next question comes uh, a reduction in uh, what's that uh, during treatment uh, would you recommend uh, not to use uh, uh, other lab I mean I think his question is uh, there is new technical, new practical techniques uh, to, de to detect the uh, ROS in semen. Uh, and I think it can be used before and during uh, treatment. Do you recommend that? ROS said, in semen. I think I have, I have, uh, I have mentioned that uh, already during my uh, talk. There are direct assays and there are indirect assays. Most of the commercially available assays are indirect. So they are looking at the effect of antioxidants on the protein, on the DNA, on the RNA. So it's indirect, but it can give you a, a good estimate of the antioxidant production. But even if they are using the indirect assay, it is costly. So that prohibits its daily use. You cannot just ask, for antioxidant assay, uh, sorry, the reactive oxygen species assay as a routine like semen analysis or as a routine as a hormones. It is very expensive. And I'm aware of only two labs in the kingdom who can afford to do this. Nothing else, because it's not commonly done. Uh, it's not commercially affordable. Uh, most of the labs are not interested to jump on this. It's only in a very specialized reproductive center so who do this. And the rationale also behind this, they said, so what? If you, if you know that person have like 300 or 400, uh, uh, whatever uh, number of, uh, of, uh, of assay, yeah. you will give the same antioxidant therapy, whether this is yes or not. At the end, you will do IVF, XC, if the, nothing works up. It is only important when it becomes affordable, with, uh, with affordable price to use it to study or to, to monitor the progress of your treatment, progress of your treatment, but you cannot make a conclusion in your treatment based on the level of antioxidant or of the reactive oxygen species. So the answer, it is very yeah, another, expensive and, and and you cannot you cannot do it routinely. Uh, this Romax, do you think it's uh, enough for treatment of uh, leukospermia? I don't use it in. Uh, as a personal uh, practice, most of the leukocytospermia, they respond in my practice to either quinolones or to doxycycline. So for those patients, if I don't have a clear culture evidence of, uh, of a specific organism that can be killed by specific antibodies, antibiotics, I give them a two weeks course of either uh, ciprofloxacin or two weeks course of uh, of doxycycline, depending on which patient I'm looking at, young or old or middle-aged. Okay, here uh, a question, maybe very practical. Do we, should we do semen culture in all cases? This is number one. And if there is uh, uh, antibiotic, empirical antibiotic, we can use till we, uh, till we get the result? Okay, so, Generally speaking, I do semen culture for any patients with leukocytospermia more than 1 million. 1 million. Or if it's less than 1 million, if the patient is going for IVF. 
Now, based on the culture, I start prescribing antibiotic. I, there is no need, there is no rush to start an empirical antibiotic before you get the culture. Most of the time, and I have to say this from my uh, uh, practical experience, most of the time the culture comes back negative, but you have leukocytes in the semen. And in that case, I start empirical treatment, but after I have a negative culture, and I have to make sure also the patient have collected the semen in a proper way. Sometimes it's just contamination. So if I know that patient, I give him the clear instruction how to collect the semen in a proper way and still have negative culture, bleucocytospermia above 1 million per ml, I start either one of those quinolones or doxycycline, dobromycea, for two weeks. And I repeat the semen after that. Okay. In case if you give somebody antioxidants and then the wife got pregnant after one month or two months, would you continue for six months or you stop it? خلاص. It's my practice. I will Actually, continue. It is, it is my belief I should continue till, till that patient passed, or till the pregnancy passed the critical period of the first three months. So for me, at yeah. least three months. Maybe you prefer six months, but I will not stop it once pregnancy happened till I'm sure that the pregnancy is stable. And knowing what we know now, maybe he should continue for one year, one year because uh, maybe it's anti-aging and it make him younger. Uh, being uh, an oxidative, uh, an expensive treatment. Uh, uh, this is an expensive treatment. Do you think it's an expensive treatment? Would you think that? Uh, uh, It's important to use it. it is, it's not a myth to use it. Well, if you are still saying it's a myth, that means I did not deliver my message very well. It is not a myth. It is not a fiction. There is a science behind it. But the problem, how to decide on which supplement you will give to your patient. And I hope I have done my job here to just if you just finish this webinar by knowing that antioxidant therapy is important, it's here to stay, it's not a myth. You need to give the most essential antioxidant treatment, as I said, carnitine, leucopene, um, and, uh, and KQ10, and zinc. I believe those are the most important trace elements that have to be in any antioxidant therapy. The question that comes after that, you need to provide the appropriate dosage because if you go to the market, you will see a lot of antioxidants, combined antioxidant therapy. Most of them are in a powder sachet form. Some of them are very cheap. Some of them are expensive. Before you decide whether this is really expensive, you should not take it, or this is cheap, this is better for my patient, just flip the bag and look at the concentration. If you have enough concentration, and I give you one example, L-carnitine. If that medication is not enough to give your patient at least two grams daily of carnitine, do not use it alone, or just look for another supplement that have at least two grams of carnitine. And, and you can measure this on other trace elements. And I provided a table here for the recommended daily dose when it comes to sperm function that we need to consider by before choosing uh, the the medication. So please don't don't be fooled by the the price itself before you look into the concentration of each individual um, uh, combined antioxidant therapy. Uh, minimal month of uh, using uh, antioxidant. Well, the sperm cycle should be at least nine days, uh, ninety days. We know after sixty-two days, we might have. Uh, changes in the sperm parameters, but it's better to stay at least for 90 days, i.e. three months, before you say, well, there's an effect or no effect. So personally, I give it for two cycles, three months plus three months. If there is no effect, I don't give any more. What about, uh, this is outside, uh, maybe, but do, do you recommend the computer assistance semi analysis? over the ordinary semen analysis and detecting Actually, the uh, parameters. Does not indicate, the, the evidence does not indicate superiority of the CASA over the, uh, of the, over the ordinary semen analysis. So the answer is no. 
Okay. Nutrition and fertility means balanced diet, right? That's so right. why should we start? Why should we start diet and diet and diet from the beginning of life? This is a, a comment, a nice comment. <laughs> well, this is a philosophical uh, actually question and comment. Our diet is not healthy. And that's why we should uh, use a healthy diet. So, and, and this is uh, not easy to, uh, to strict in our hectic da daily life. So, healthy diet is not palatable to start with. It's not enjoyable, I have to say that. And we eat a lot of junk food to make us happy. And that's why we have a lot of oxidative stress. Uh, it's known that vitamin E is uh, one of important <laughs> anti-oxidant, -co anti-oxidants. But uh, you drop it from your list. Why is it? Because uh, everybody know about it, or because it's not important? No, actually, it is important, and I have already mentioned that in the trace elements when it comes to the, the first slide of trace elements, but. Is it important more than those four things that I left, I put in the from the literature review, from the reading that I went through, those are the most important thing. That does not mean you should not include vitamin E. I said you need a lot, you don't need one medication, you need a lot of antioxidants, combined antioxidants. But those four should be always present in any formula that you are giving to your patients. Adding vitamin E to them, it's very good, no problem. And I personally, I give vitamin E 400 units BID uh, with the other antioxidant medication that I give to my patients. This is, uh, I said, um, would you recommend that uh, once we take history, physical examination, or send patient for investigation, we start them on antioxidants? No. The answer is no. Antioxidant is is a medical treatment like any other medication. You should use it uh, when it is needed. So if the investigations came back with a patient suggestive of ongoing infection, I will not start antioxidant therapy. I will treat the infection. If the patient comes with in a status of hypogonadism, I should treat hormonal disturbance before. Antioxidant is complementary. So you add it to another medication or you keep it as the sole medications once everything else is happy and excluded. And this is actually a reason why some antioxidants didn't work because we did not use them appropriately. We use them either prematurely before we treat the underlying disease or we use them subtherapeutic or we use them in the wrong patients. Yeah, uh, anti uh, anti uh, oxidate oxidants uh, does it have any positive effect on sexual dysfunction and erection dysfunction well uh, two of them uh, are implicated in the erectile function of uh, individual uh, human male which are the zinc as i said it's a potent uh, uh, trace element for uh, testosterone production and hence potency and also uh, uh, arginine. Arginine is important for the cavernosal body and blood circulation in the human uh, male organ. This is another antioxidant. It's not important too much for, for uh, uh, male factor infertility, although there are some studies that indicate uh, arginine is important for motility and progressive motility, but its main function uh, uh, is for uh, the uh, the blood circulation in the in the corporal cavernosa. Okay. Uh, how, again, this is uh, time wise. How long should we continue this medication before IVF or exit? Uh, for for the male, uh, I'm not talking here about uh, women. For the male, uh, three months plus three months. So a total of six months. Okay. Uh, can you highlight on the DNA fragmentation, quick highlight on sperm DNA fragmentation, 
because it's becoming uh, model yeah, that's true I have to compare, exactly I have to compare the the people asking about uh, sperm DNA fragmentation essays this year compared to last year compared to 10 years ago 10 years ago nobody is have heard about this and nobody's talking about this for the last two years people are more interested in the uh, sperm DNA fragmentation essay but again unfortunately it have been um, tested for or uh, requested uh, for um, for the long for the wrong individuals we know now as i said before like 30 to to 40 percent of male factor infertility causes are idiopathic now we know those part of this idiopathic factors are sperm dna sperm dna sperm dna fragmentation or decondensation so you might have a normal sperms when it comes to ordinary semen analysis you have a normal shape a normal motility progressive motility but unfortunately the backbone of the sperm which is the dna is broken and that can explain why we have a lot of failures when it comes to uh, ivf exe cycles although we are trying our best to select the most appropriate sperms for injection now sperm dna fragmentation can give you a clue why we are failing can give you a clue why there are certain people have idiopathic infertility although the semen analysis is normal and for those people you have to look for factors causing the dna fragmentation and treat them before you jump into other uh, other treatments but what we know what we have what i can notice nowadays sperm dna fragmentation is being asked for everybody now if you have a patient with low motility you have a patient with abnormal morphology if you have a patient with leukocytospermia there is no need to do a dna fragmentation for him because it will come abnormal you have a reason for that but the main cornerstone or the main indication for sperm dna fragmentation when you have everything normal and you have nothing to explain why they cannot get pregnant either natural or frequent ivf cycle failures that's by that time i go and ask for dna fragmentation so please don't ask for it when you have abnormal semen ask for it when you have a normal semen to look for other causes okay uh, what is uh, lycopene lycopene is 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 the is a macronutrient found in tomato uh, what's the natural sources natural source of like tomato tomato is the natural source tomato what is the effect of uh, emf on fertility sorry what's the effect of emf I don't know what is EMF. I'm not quite yeah. sure what is EMF. Can you, the one who asked the question, can he write what is EMF, please? Uh, who can prescribe antioxidants? Gynecologists, andrologists, general doctor. And you don't want me to answer that, right? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> that's, that's a political question. No, even if you say that neurologist, uh, tomorrow I'm going to prescribe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, ultimately, just I want from this meeting is to prescribe it in the appropriate way. That's all. But, uh, you know, antioxidants can be prescribed by anybody. I think in my dictionary as a urologist, uh, as a background, I think male factor should be dealt by a urologist and neurologist. And Investigation for males should be done by andrologist. Treatment of males should be done by andrologist. I don't think you would be happy if I start treating ovulation failure by a urologist. Um, but uh, antioxidant can be used for, uh, can be um, prescribed by a female, by a gynecologist for female, of course, uh, because uh, we we do uh, believe that antioxidant in female have uh, a very good effect on the ovary and it has uh, uh, improved the quality of eggs during IVF. Uh, and uh, I usually mention this, uh, I don't know if you know it or not, or hear about it, that in uh, 
in Nigeria, there is a small village uh, that whenever they get pregnant, they get pregnant with twins. And uh, people, they were wondering why this happening. They thought it's just a, a lifestyle. So one of the doctor went there and tried to find out what is the uh, effect. And he, he found that uh, most of the this uh, village, they like uh, a sweet potato. Sweet potato, Jizar Yamani. Jizar Yamani, potato halwa. And uh, it was found that in Jizar Yamani, there is a lot of CoQ10. So CoQ10, uh, and in, in the United States and Canada now, people, they believe that if they take CoQ10, they might harbor uh, twins. So they, everybody wants to get pregnant and she wants to have a twins, she get uh, CoQ10. Of course, uh, companies now, they took it and they make it as antioxidants, capsules, and they calculated the dose, and the dose is about 600 milligram, and it's one of the important antioxidants in uh, female uh, subfertility. So we do, we do know about antioxidants a little bit, not like you guys, but uh, definitely it's uh, effective in, uh, in uh, female infertility. Uh, I, I just I want I want to be clear, Prof. Hassan. Yeah. I don't mean prescribing antioxidants for females. I mean gynecologists pre prescribing antioxidants for the for the male. Yeah. I think it is not a good practice, and I will not accept that. Also, for neurologists who are prescribing medication for his male patient and saying give the same medication for your wife, it should not happen like this. A uh, specialist should be the one in charge of the medication to give the appropriate antioxidant and to monitor the effect. But gender-specific medication by specialists, of course. A major problem in our practice that uh, whenever you're treating the husband, uh, the, ma the, 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 the wife, you give her the medication, you tell her, oh, give it to your husband as well. Exactly. Uh, I, I don't think this is uh, this is right. Exactly. Uh, what's the role of antioxidants uh, prior to TASA or micro -tasa? Uh If you are talking about um, frequent IVF failure uh, from uh, uh, with the sperm retrieval, I do give it actually for my patients before retrieval, but not the first one. So the first trial for IVF by retrieved sperms from the testes by either micro TZ or or TZ or TZA, I just go I go ahead without any medication and I do it. I provide the sperms. But if this failed, yes, I give antioxidant therapy for three months at least. Uh, um, better to be six months before another therapeutic retrieval for XC cycle. Um, if and if the patient is going for ICSI from ejaculate sperms, ICSI for ejaculate sperms, if, the, if, there is, if there is nothing else, like the semen analysis is normal, I do still give it with the promise that a DNA might be, it might be dysfunction causing the dysfunction of the sperm. So I give it also even in a normal semen analysis with the hope that this can naturalize any DNA fragmentation that can happen. Of course, this is better to do it after you uh, affirm DNA fragmentation by appropriate assay. So maybe this is the, will be the last question. Uh, why do you prefer to give it in combination, not uh, each one separately? And why it's almost always in sachet, not in tablets? Well, trust me, I, I ask this question to different pharmaceutical companies, why it cannot be in a tablet form? And the, 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 uh, the answer that I got um, consistently for most of them, it's very difficult to mix all of this macronutrient in one tablet. They are not stable. So this has to do with the pharmacokinetic of the medications. They are not stable enough to be in one tablet form. And the easiest way is to do it in a session, in a powder form, so they are more stable. 
Now, why I don't use individual micronutrient? Because of ease of use. So if you combine all what you need in one sachet, the compliance will be higher. Patient will save more money. Suppose you are taking L-carnitine alone and QQ10 alone, zinc alone, lycopene alone. The combined price for all of this will be higher than any available. The best antioxidant available in the Saudi market will be cheaper than those four individual alone. And at the same time, it is not, it's not, uh, it is not uh, uh, favorable for the patient to stick to a four medications every day. Uh, طيب, I think this is this. Uh, على فكرة, the last question is my question, huh? and you said you asked all the company, and I always ask the, the same company what, why, and they answer the same. The same. I think uh, the other thing is maybe registration in Saudi Saudi FDA will be more difficult if it's in a capsule form. This is one of the answers I got also. But anyway, it was, you know, I cannot express my thank to Professor uh, Saleh who gave a very, very interesting, very comprehensive, basic and clinical. And he answered the question in details that I think now anybody who listened to this uh, presentation, he would know antioxidants in male subfertility and in, in female and I think he would know what to do and how he should approach uh, male uh, fertility. Uh, definitely the urologists and andrologists will benefit more than gynecologists but definitely the gynecologists would understand why the andrologists give the antioxidant. I really thank you very much for the, the presentation, for the answering the question. I really like to ask, uh, uh, to, to thank Tabuk and Mahmoud for his uh, great effort in, uh, in, in uh, preparing and, and helping uh, getting this uh, presentation, this form. Uh, dopamine has uh, always uh, been with us and final, Thank you to the Jamia Saudi Rajul. And I was talking to Dr. Uh, Professor Saleh uh, today about uh, why male are Muslims, not in the home Jamia Kathir. I mean, Jamia Saudi Alam Rabbad Nisa or Bilada, Jamia Sahat al Mar, or Jamia al Mar. And I'm a Rajul only two, two years ago they have this. Uh, Jamia Saudi al Sahat al Rajul, although there, is, there was a, the urology uh, society for a long period of time, al Jamia Saudi al Masalik al Bawliya. Anyway, it was really nice uh, presentation. Uh, Prof. Saleh, again, I would like to ask you uh, and thank you, and uh, hopefully that we will have another. Uh, another presentation hopefully with uh, the same company hopefully with different uh, project and uh, subject from uh, from uh, that deal with the male and female uh, thank you prof saleh thank you prof uh, hassan and uh, i extend my sincere thank to the saudi society of obstetric and gynecology for showing the interest and also to our my colleagues in uh, saudi men's health who also showed interest in attending this webinar. Uh, my thanks also to the organizing company, the sponsoring company. I'm looking forward for another fruitful, uh, either on-site uh, lectures or another live webinars. Thank you very much. Uh, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.